For RCR TV, I'm Sean Kinney, and I'm pleased to be joined today by Steve Haitley, who is the Senior Director of Industry and Partner Marketing for CompTel. Uh, Steve, we're going to cover a lot of ground today from uh, enterprise sales transformation to virtualization, but I wanted to get started by talking about some of the exciting things that CompTel has going on right now. One of those is Nexterday Alley. So can you tell our viewers what Nexterday Alley is and what some of the goals behind it are? Yeah, sure. So Comptel are hosting um, a fairly big industry event in Helsinki on the 9th and 10th of November, uh, which is basically open to the general public, uh, but also running in parallel with our own uh, user group, which we run every year. Next Today Alley is actually going to be a showcase area within the Next Today North conference, uh, where we're going to use our uh, ecosystem of partners and some of the innovative solutions that we've built to really show the industry or make the industry think a little bit on uh, how they can think ahead, think again, think across, and think differently about you know how they address customer requirements in the future. Okay, and so what are some of the major topics that participants are going to see addressed at Next Your Day Alley? Um, so there's so there's two, there's two key areas really. Um, so one section we're going to take the operator on a journey to virtualization, uh, and there are three um, key steps or three demonstration blueprints that we're going to show in that journey. Uh, it goes from enterprise sales transformation, which um, gives a demonstration on how the sales organisations of service providers can work a little bit more effectively uh, to address the needs of their customers and how they can deliver more accurate and timely services. We then take them on a journey through uh, through virtualization, which you know the first step really is setting up the virtualized network. And one of the key hot topics in the industry at the moment is bringing on board new virtual network functions. So we're really going to show the onboarding process and how you can streamline it and then make those virtualized services available into the, into the sales channel. Then the final step of that journey to virtualization that we're going to showcase is really the dynamic lifecycle management of those VNF services, or NFV services, I should say. Uh, so this is really you taking the assumption now that the customer you know, has got services which have been delivered, which are based on uh, NFV technology. How do you make sure that those services are reactive and dynamic so that the customer can take maximum use uh, of the virtualized environment that they've been deployed in? So once we've taken them through the operator journey to virtualization, we've then got three innovative demonstrations which um, focus very much on uh, data collection, data processing, data analytics. Um, and take, you know, we look at some very key topics which will also be discussed during the conference at Next Today North. The first one being um, smart IoT, so smart living with IoT, uh, where we're looking at various you know we're taking the assumption that you know ultimately our entire world is going to be connected in some way over the next few years but with all of this data and all of these potential applications that could be used how do you um how do you capture it all how do you use all that information to the best to enhance your life so we're basically going to showcase an application which takes inputs from multiple verticals of iot um, and then builds effectively a, um, a services marketplace that can then be visualized on a, on a mobile application. Um, we've also got, uh, the next one is accelerating the product lifecycle. So this is talking about how generation cloud customers no longer uh, uh, wait for um, new products to mature and get delivered in, in long and timely and, and non-timely ways. Uh, and, and our existing processes that we use to deliver those products you know, don't, don't uh, conform to the requirements of Generation Cloud. So here we're showing really a dynamic way to look at the way products are being used, how you optimize the use of those products, how you design new products to meet the actual requirements of Generation Cloud, and then how you deliver them and configure them so they can be placed in the marketplace. And then after that, of course, monitoring how those products have been adopted so that you can make adjustments accordingly to, to make sure that you stay in step with, the with Generation Cloud customers. And then the final demonstration that we're gonna show is we called it hyper personalized customer engagement where we take um, multiple concepts um, related to generation cloud uh, around uh, context customer and content so basically if you're going to deliver um, good and accurate services to customers of generation cloud 
You need to understand what context they're living in, um, what are their actual requirements, and how have they been using products in the past, for example, um, what type of content is best suited for their requirements, and then, of course, what channels are they most likely to be connected to? Is it a mobile channel? Is it an online channel? And basically, we pull all these concepts together and link it together with a, a campaign management platform and sales automation processes. So really, you're looking at next best product recommendation and how you align your, your products into your sales set, which are going to be contextually delivered to your customer. So as you can see, it's a fairly broad set of demonstrations. Um, we're delivering those demonstrations along with our ecosystem of partners. Uh, and partners that work in different fields and deliver software services or solutions uh, with and alongside us. So you told us a lot about what you're doing with Nextyourday Alley in terms of reaching that very valuable market segment that you described as Generation Cloud. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about empowering enterprise sales transformation. Um, you know, there's a number of ways that that organizations can improve their process, but they all require a new way of approaching efficiency, accuracy, and, and customer experience. So to start this conversation, uh, Steve, what issues do you see right now in the traditional business-to-business -business sales process? Um, a lot of it, I mean, this actually came from operators that, we, that we'd actually worked with. They said that there was a massive gap between what their enterprise sales team go, goes out and positions and sells to their customers compared to what ultimately gets delivered at the end. Um, if you look at, I mean, we did some primary research with Analysis Mason earlier on in the year, which indicated that there was um, a massive potential for fallout, you know, up to 70% fallout of new products brought to market as they're being delivered um, while they're waiting to get to maturity because the processes are broken down at various stages. So if you think about the traditional sales cycle, you know, you'll, you, you get the lead and you go out and see the customer and you're on their site and you take their configuration requirements, you know, what sort of services they want and products they want. Then you would take, and, and that would be loosely based on a fairly static commercial product catalog, really, which has been designed, you know, for some months or some years previous to that. Now, if you look at the dynamic state of networks, fixed and static commercial product catalogs can quite easily get out of step with what can physically be delivered in the network itself. Um, so by the time you've gone out and you've spoken to the enterprise customer, you've designed their product, you've then configured the product or you've written it down as a configuration, you've sent it out for their, as a proposal, uh, and you've got the acceptance from the customer eventually after numerous stages of, of uh, reiteration of new sites, new services that need to be added. Um, only then, when you get the customer acceptance, do you then tend to throw it over the wall into the fulfillment solution or the provisioning platform to say, yeah, go deliver this. But there's, you know, there's been a massive sales cycle, potentially up to nine months, trying to deliver services before you suddenly throw it over the wall, by which time your network could have changed. There's new products being installed, new platforms being put in place. Um, and that's why a lot of these services tend to have a big fallout, fallout rate. rate. So, I mean, that, that's really where we've seen the challenge, and, we, and that's why we, we set out to, um, to configure the solution that we did. Yeah, so when we consider this protracted sales process and, and all of the, the risks involved, like uh, fallout, you said 70%, that's, I mean, that's a, a big number, but there are alternatives to that sales process, and, and one of them is to uh, take a more conversational approach to it. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what that conversation would look like and, and who should be involved in it? Yeah, it's not so matter who, it's, it's, it's how really. It's looking at the very linear and static processes that you've got to deliver a service. So like I was just saying, you know, you, you choose a product from a, from a commercial product catalog, you then pass it down to an order management engine, which then passes it down to a provisioning platform. And, you know, it's, it's a very static route that it takes, a very linear route, I should say, that it takes. Um, but really you know, you need to have a more of a, a conversational approach where the processes are continually interrogating each other to check whether there are better ways of doing things, there are accurate configurations in play, and has anything changed since the last time I looked at it? And it's all about that dynamic conversation. And in this, in this particular instance for this enterprise sales transformation, what we do is we take 
the massive amount of network intelligence that we've got within a within a fulfillment um, platform in in our case in in, in Flow One, um, and we publish that intelligence a lot earlier in the sales cycle. So when you come to do your uh, customer configuration of their order, and you're trying to find out what they've selected from the commercial catalog and how it could be delivered. At that time, you are still conversationally talking to your network assets to say, "Yes, we've got those resources; they are available." Um, you know, yes, this order makes sense. We're connecting this product with this product. Uh, these ports connect together. This configuration is correct, and you're checking all of this all of the time while you are going through the product configuration process. Um, and then once you get to the point of throwing it over the wall, literally it makes it a lot simpler because a lot of the resources have been reserved and, and, and are in place. Um, so you know that you're going to get uh, the service as and when you want it, really. It's the, you know, the timely delivery of an accurate service, really. And this uh, dynamic conversational sales approach is, is something that's going to be demonstrated at the Next Day North event we talked about earlier, correct? It is, yeah. It's it's one of the it's the first journey that we take. So the, I mean, the journey itself, we you know we talk about um, the the journey to virtualization really is give your salespeople the right skills to work in the new environment, in the new um, you know the new uh, NFV architectures that are going to be in place. Then talk about putting those architectures in place and then manage the customer experience once you've actually delivered the services. So it's a nice walkthrough and a nice sensible journey to take. Yeah. And so when we talk about adding this dynamic quality to the sales process, the next kind of logical step would seem to be to add that same dynamic quality to your, uh, your infrastructure through virtualization. You mentioned NFV uh, just a moment ago. So what are the, the benefits to virtualization of the, the network and the service environments? I mean, it's, it's been quite widely documented, you know, uh, everybody's talking about NFV, it's the latest marketing buzzwords. Um, <laughs> but, but really, you know, we talk about cost savings and we talk about agility. These, they're, those are the two main ones that tend to come out. You know, in my personal view, you know, the cost savings won't be apparent earlier on in the cycle because you've still got to invest in the new technology. But ultimately, the cost savings will kick in because you're no longer having um, rigid vendor tied hardware you've got commoditized hardware and you can be a lot more um, uh, you, know, uh, you, you can be better with your costs basically the cost model works better but in terms of the agility I think there's a number of great advantages that can be gained from having a more agile product set which is pretty much controlled by by the software layer um, ultimately you've got a faster time to market because you can deploy your services quicker and you can deploy changes to the services quicker because you're basically installing uh, software instances in a data center that can then be rolled out into the network as opposed to waiting for delivery of cards and shipments and configuration of ports and all of that information. Um, also, um, you know, the agility side plays into the bespoke requirements of customers. So, we, we've been very fixated by here's a commercial product catalog. Here's a set of products which we can deliver. And if you try and stray outside of that, you're at risk of not being able to deliver the product. But now because enhancements to that product catalog could be quite rapidly implemented, um, you're, you're a lot more agile in the way you can meet the bespoke requirements of your enterprise customers in this particular case. Uh, also, the competitiveness. I mean, you know, because you can react a lot quicker in rolling out new services, it means that operators can compete against either OTTs or their or their peers. Um, and then finally, I suppose you know the advantage is that having the software and the interactions, the peering that, that can be made with the, with the software through the data center, um, you can bring in partner applications a lot quicker into those virtual environments and bundle those together as part of these virtualized services. So you know you see it there. You, you know people say it's about cost saving. It is ultimately, but I think there's a lot more focus can be can be gained from looking at the agility side of things. Yeah, agility, as you said, that is a, a big buzzword, and it's really a, the driver of competitiveness, which in such a, a quickly evolving market is is crucial. And another thing you hit on there that I, I've been seeing more and more about is is product customization, which is really uh, a key to these enterprise customers with uh, their various applications. So. When we talk about providing customized services to clients 
what are some of the tools that help automate that process and, and speed it up? Uh, to customize, I mean, uh, we, one of the big ones is the use of the uh, technical service catalog. So, you know, we talked about the product catalog earlier, which sits very much in the sales, um, the sales domain. But really, if you, if you think about a, a technical service catalog, what you're doing is you're designing um, abstract technical requirements to deliver products in the network itself. Um, and they can be designed around reusable components. So if you quickly want to change a specific product with a small modification like a bandwidth allowance or a policy change or whatever it may be, then you can do that if you've got these abstract um, bundles of, of technical configuration that can be reused based on customer facing and resource facing services. And I think when you move towards virtualization, again, it, it's a good link into virtualization because um, you can still model the virtualization, uh, the uh, the virtualized functions that you're going to be bringing in the VNS, you can model those into your technical service catalog, and then they can be used as and when they're needed to deliver the end-to-end -end service. So I think you know a service catalog um, construct is definitely uh, you know a key tool to deliver this agility. Yes. So Steve, can you give us an example of an organization that's successfully deployed some of these uh, tools? Um, I mean, virtualization is still, you know, it's still very new from a, from a, a telco perspective, you know, uh, virtualizing networks. I mean, there are a number of a number of operators who are taking the lead on the proof of concepts and, and trialing these concepts together. Um, I mean, Deutsche Telekom are one of the leaders here. Telefonica are quite active. Vodafone are looking at these concepts as well. It's, it's happening all over the world, really. You know, there's a, you know, if you look at uh, Etsy, so we're a member of the European Telecommunication Standards Institute. We, um, they have got an NFE program. Uh, and um, which which we're heavily plugged into, and if you look at the amount of proof of concepts which are currently running, you know they've got a you know a number of um, I think there's over thirty, I think it's thirty five they're up to at the moment. But we've seen also seen reports that are currently you know two hundred and fifty ongoing um, proof of concepts rolled out into networks at the moment. So it's very much in its trial phases. You know this 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 the whole concept of NFV and virtualization is a it's a story that's going to run and run. Uh, I was at a conference only yesterday in London where uh, at an analyst conference and we were just talking about, you know, realistically, we're talking 10 years before this is properly embedded in networks and properly being used and all its advantages are being gained. Um, you know, some operators are saying, yes, we're going to deploy our NFV in, in the next two years. But re in reality, when you look at what they're actually doing, they're looking to virtualize some services based on NFV, on, on virtualization, but their core network is still going to remain pretty much the same. They're still going to rely on this massive investiture they've made in investment they've made in MPLS, in IP MPLS, et cetera, and IP networks. So, you know, we're not going to see a massive, you know, migration away from traditional networks to, uh, to virtualization. We'll just turn one off and turn one on. That just won't happen. Um, and, and, and in fact, the way that CompTEL is approaching this market in particular is um, as an, uh, a revolution through evolution. So, you know, NFV and virtualization of the network is such a cataclysmic change to the way we've always done things. It's not just about networks anymore. It's about networks, people, processes, and the whole way that we conduct our business in telco. Um, but it's going to be gradual and it's going to be a case of, right, let's leave this massive investment we've made in this big IP network and the way we do services and let's gradually introduce a few services which are virtualized. Then we'll start virtualizing certain domains within the network, and, you know, and ultimately we'll get to this point. But at the moment, it's still a long way off. Yeah, All right. So 10 years, I'm going to get back in touch with you in a decade and we'll, we'll see. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably have a load of service providers now saying, no, 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 we're going to have ours deployed in three. You know, we're going to switch everything off in three years. But, you know, I'll wait to see that reality. All right, Steve. So if we could um, shift gears a little bit earlier in our conversation, you mentioned the Internet of Things, which is a really exciting, a quickly evolving space. But right now, kind of limited in the, the verticals that it addresses but as the technology keeps growing and keeps uh, gaining adoption, we'll see the capabilities and the solutions that are available increase too. And I know CompTEL has a hand in this with its CompTEL smart living concept. So can you give us an overview of the smart living concept and uh, tell us about some of the verticals that are included? 
Uh, yeah, so, you know, Smart Living, we're basically looking at, um, you know, we're looking across the board, really. So you're talking about connected health. We're talking about connected home. Uh, we're talking about insurance. We're talking about um, telecommunications and smart city. And we're looking at pulling in all of those concepts and all of the data that would be generated by the use of devices there um, and how you can understand, analyze, consolidate that data to create you know, a sensible marketplace for, for IoT that you can manage and you can get involved with because it's going to be part of your life. Um, and at the core of this, at the core of this uh, solution that, we, that we're going to be showcasing is, um, is our complex event processing and analytics capability. So it's really going to be how we apply that to collect structured and unstructured and various other forms of data um, you know, and, and put it into the mix to come up with some sensible uh, IoT services marketplace. I mean, for the demo itself, we're working with um, the forum Virium Helsinki. So it's based on um, uh, participation with an actual uh, government organization uh, in, in Helsinki. We're also working with a company called Medicine, who are providing us with the, obviously, with the app, one of the applications there. And also Pivotal is one of our partners that we're showcasing there. Uh, as part of this smart living concept as well. All right. You know, and as, as the IoT takes shape, it's becoming, you know, apparent that one of the key hubs is going to be the smartphone. And so with that in mind, I understand you guys have a smart living mobile app. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the functionality that's built into that application? Yeah, I mean, so, so basically the app will be built, uh, you know, it'll be um, collecting um, information and data from our processing, as I mentioned, our data processing engine. Um, and it, it will basically represent each of the applications. So you'll have your health app and you'll have a, you know, a sort of front view of this application will show you how your health is performing for snapshot view. So, for example, if you are if you've only done 30 percent of your required steps for the day, it will say, you know, get active. You know, at the same time, it could say, um, uh, you know, click on the app here and you can control the, the heat sensors in your home or, or whatever else. But it's basically pulling all of your smart living apps into one specific view so that you can really control your life, basically. And that's what we're going to be focused on. All right. And earlier we talked about uh, Generation Cloud and, you know, this is an, an impatient group. They expect instantaneous uh, sort of access and gratification. I think apps are a great uh, demonstrative uh, example of that and that, you know, in two weeks, 50 million people can download an app. Then two weeks later, it's been bumped off by the next big thing. <laughs> Isn't so, that the truth? Yeah. yeah we, but when you look at a, an ecosystem like that, that changes so quickly, what are some of the opportunities that are present for mobile operators that are ready to capitalize? Um, I think, you know, it comes down to analytics. I mean, analytics has been a, a hot topic or a hot buzzword for a while. We've moved away from pure business intelligence to real actionable analytics. Um, so understanding, you know, the context in which, uh, consumers are using applications, where they're using the applications, why they're using the applications, who within their social circles are also using those applications and then using that information to properly construct new products or new ways to engage with that particular uh, consumer group. Um, you know, there's, there's so much that can be learned, but you know, it, the whole um, buzz, buzz about big data, which started, you know, a few years ago. Um, I mean, big data is, is more of a marketing term than anything. I think, I mean, we've been collecting, records from operators for the last 20 odd years um, who are you know delivering 10 billion consumer records a day you know but we know we know what big data is you know we've, we've dealt in that but it's really in the last two years been a focus on how do you make not only how do you make that data actionable it's how do you make the right data actionable and how do you make it actionable in context to your consumers um, and those are the more important steps to make you know to make it really right and, and generation cloud is exactly all about that it's getting the right context the right content in the right context to the right people at the right time you know and that, that's pretty much sums it up and so then i can't tell I, I know can help clients sort of accelerate that product life cycle while keeping in mind the data monetization uh, factors and I, I think a lot of that isn't your the product's called data faster mind right 
Yeah. So data faster mind is the intelligence that we put behind our complex event processing. So um, data refinery is what we use for the collection and processing of data. And then data faster mind is the intelligence, which then looks at intelligent insights and the predictive nature of the uh, of the data itself. Uh, and, the, and you know, forming the patterns and the trends and understanding what they do. And in fact, in the in one of the demonstrations, one of the blueprints that we're showcasing, um, accelerating the product lifecycle, it's exactly about this. It's about um, products no longer have the time to mature. <laughs> By the time they've even started to mature, something else has come along and people have switched on to it, like you said earlier. Uh, so, so really what we're looking at is using the analytics to instantaneously look at product usage in an instant for different segments, product adoption, where it's been used, how it's been used, based on that information, make intelligent adjustments to the way that product is then pushed to market, and then redesign the policies, et cetera, which are needed in the network to deliver that product to the right people at the right time. And it's really closing that dynamic loop that, we, that we're really focusing on in that particular, um, in that particular demonstration. And in fact, we're, we're actually, sorry, yeah, we're working with, um, so Hitachi is our um, partner in that particular showcase where Hitachi, we're using the Hitachi virtual EPC in order to get those policies uh, configured and onto the network. So, yeah. Okay. And, and no good conversation about data is complete without a, a side conversation about security and privacy. So how do you help service providers balance their data monetization strategy with uh Mind, being mindful of their customers' concerns around privacy and security as it relates to that data? Yeah, I, I think, you know, there's a number of things that you can do, and we, we always get asked this question, of how do you how do you address the segment of one um, without exposing and, and, and using their data? And I, and I think a lot of it is, is to do with the way analytics uses the intelligent trending and patterns that it can build based on... Um, Consumer groups, really. So you can look at a consumer group, look at the patterns as they relate to a different type of consumer group. Is there an overlap there? How are they using it? What did they do in order to allow them to use the data in that particular way? And then you can actually segment the market really low down without really digging into the bits and bytes of what people are saying to each other on text messages, etc. So you can do that. Okay. And Steve, I was hoping you could tell me what the 4C principle is. Yeah, again, it's it's all about Generation Cloud. You know, we, you know, if if anybody has uh, read our the book that we produced uh, next Operation Next Today, which we produced earlier this year, um, which we've had actually about fifteen thousand copies have gone out the door, which is quite impressive for a software company. But um, yeah, in there we talk about Generation Cloud, uh, and Generation Cloud is really, as I've mentioned already, you know, getting the right content in the right context to the right people at the right time. Um, because uh, Generation Cloud won't hang around. They won't wait for you know, you to sort your act out. You've got to get it right to them as they want it. And they don't want to be flooded with marketing messages and, and marketing campaigns which aren't relevant to them. And that, that's, that says, and you, I'm sure you can relate to that the same as I can, that as soon as I get text messages from somebody who's selling something I've got no interest in, it make you know it annoys me you know and you want to try and avoid those you don't want to upset your subscribers and because if operators aren't putting intelligence in place that stops that information getting through to the subscriber it's not the company who's sending out the text that's um that, that, that's the problem it's the operator because they are ultimately responsible for the subscriber so they'll get a bad reputation for not monitoring the privacy you know, respect for, for their consumers. And this is really what this, um, this customer engagement blueprint is all about. It's looking at uh, the context. So here you're looking at you know, mobile usage, internet usage, location, social interaction, and the type of connected devices which are being used. It's looking at um, the customer themselves. So you look at the customer, you look at their um, their identity or their um, their personal details that they've got on the CRM system, and you take that into consideration. You can enrich their their customer profiles based on some of the um, the intelligence that you're producing, um, and then you look at the sort of content that's available. Is the content catalogued? correctly so that it, you can cherry pick the bits of content which are relevant to your specific consumers and then of course more importantly how do they want to receive 
your interaction with them? What is most relevant to them? Is it the smartphone? Is it uh, through Facebook? Is it through uh, Twitter? Is it through some other application? Is it even through something that as they walk past a shop in a high street? You know, how do you, how do you get the message to those people? Um, but at the same time, it's tying all of those insets, insights and that intelligence into your campaign management solution to make sure that your campaigns are timely, your campaigns are uh, targeted correctly. And that's what we've really done. So in this particular blueprint, we're working with HubSpot. I'm sure most people have heard of HubSpot. Uh, we're working with um, a company called Cosmos, who are looking at um, intelligently looking at the data streams. Then we've got Tweet Atlas, Intersec, and we're also utilizing our own forward platform as well, which is our own uh, mobile application for real time monitoring. So we've got, you know, we've got a number of um, the largest selection of ecosystem partners working on this particular um, demo. Uh, so, so it should be it should be interesting. We're quite excited by it actually. So Steve, as we wrap up here, can you please uh, remind our viewers uh, some of the details of Next Your Day North and what attendees can expect to come away with and also tell us again uh, about the insights and strategic advantages that are going to be on display at Next Your Day Alley. Yeah, sure. So, so next today North, just to just to wrap up, then next today North is is going to be on the 9th and 10th of November in Helsinki. Um, we've deliberately done that. It's called a, it's called an anti seminar because we've uh, we've put it somewhere where you definitely wouldn't want to go in November. Um, but we're determined to make it a shining star in Helsinki at that time of year. Um, it's it's sitting adjacent to another conference actually called Slush, which many of our many of your listeners, sorry, would have uh, would have heard of. Um, and Slush is one of the biggest startup events in the world, uh, which is full of entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, innovators, thought leaders, uh, and we've literally tying we're tying the two concepts together. So if you get tickets for next to the day north, you also get access to to Slush as well. Um, you know, there's there's three key principles which you've got behind next to the day north which is we want to encourage um, the operator community to um, think again. So basically don't think about how you've always done things in the past. We, you know, we've got a unique opportunity at the moment to do things differently in telco. So, you know, how can you do, how can you think again? Um, uh, think, think across. Um, so basically think across is look at how other industries have solved specific problems and can you learn from those principles and apply them into telco and then think ahead you know are there any new technologies which are coming down the pipeline for example that you may find at slush and how can you implement those into your models moving forwards and that's really what we want to take out of uh, next today north next today ali uh, you know as i mentioned it's it really is um a showcase of our industry leading partners that, that we've got our ecosystem of partners um, we've got sponsoring partners such as IBM uh, Tech Mahindra Hitachi and CloudSense CloudSense who provide a cloud-based um, CPQ engine for the enterprise sales transformation story but then we've also got in there featured into these demonstrations the likes of HubSpot um, Red Hat um, Pivotal and, 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 and a lot of other uh, partners that we've got participating there. So it's really going to be worthwhile, worthwhile a visit. Well, Steve, it sounds like a great event. We appreciate you taking the time to fill us in on Next Your Day North and all of the other uh, cutting edge work that CompTEL is doing. So thanks for your time, Steve. That's great. Thanks a lot.